Welcome to our overview for Sunday School Teachers and Bible Study Leaders of LifeWay's Explore the Bible Lesson of John, Chapter 1, Verses 1-14, through 14, entitled, In the Beginning, Lesson for Sunday, December 4th, 2022. One way that you could begin this lesson would be to share that a couple of years ago, the nativity scene in St. Albans, West Virginia, received national attention. Uh, the scene there was notable because it included a stable and some sheep and camels and a donkey, even some visitors, wise men, and that was it. There was nothing in the stable, no Mary, no Joseph, and no baby Jesus. Interestingly, the two town officials that were contacted had differing stories about why there was no one in the stable. The park superintendent said the Holy Family was left out because of separation of church and state uh, concerns. Interestingly enough, the mayor, the politician, said it was just a technical difficulty, you know, too hard to get all the characters to fit inside the stable. Either way, it was definitely ironic that the one that the nativity scene is supposed to celebrate was left out. Unfortunately, though, of course, that's how, how it too often is. People celebrate all kinds of things in the Christmas season, family, their blessings, the spirit of the season, whatever that is. But oftentimes, Jesus Christ himself is left out. Our study uh, here in the book of John will take us in the direction of celebrating Jesus for who he is. Our study in the Minor Prophets was good, but I know many of you are ready for the New Testament, and this week we begin a six-month study in the book of John, one of the greatest books in the Bible, written with the express purpose that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's John 20, verse 31. We start chapter one with beginnings in a sense, but not really. Matthew and Luke have nativity uh, stories that many will share this time of year, which is absolutely appropriate to do. But we need to understand that although Jesus was born as a 100% full human being in Bethlehem, he did not come into being in Bethlehem. He always existed as God, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And John makes this very clear. This is a great passage to teach about the person and the work of Jesus. We touched on the person and work of Christ in Micah 5. We can go into more depth on it here in John with one of the clearest sections in Scripture on who Jesus is. This is a vital section for you to teach and especially for your class to understand. They will be getting hit with all kinds of wrong ideas about who Jesus is. And if they know this passage, they will be able to refute those wrong ideas. Virtually every heresy is built around some misunderstanding of the biblical view of Jesus. If you can get your group to understand today and in future days that Jesus is fully God and fully man, 100% God and 100% man, who died on the cross to completely pay for our sins, you'll have gone a long way towards keeping them from heretical religions. A chart like this one that I have here helps us to understand some of the, the six basic heresies uh, regarding the, the person of Jesus. As I said a moment ago, orthodox biblical teaching about Jesus is that he is one person who had two full natures, that he is both fully God and fully man. All the heresies of church history, and many today, are due to a misunderstanding of one of these biblical points, either that he wasn't God or he wasn't man or he wasn't fully God or he wasn't fully man. Uh, I'm going to post this uh, on on my website and in the comments of this uh, this YouTube video, you may want to copy this chart, study it, uh, copy it, maybe hand it out to your group or post it up on on the wall or, or write it out on your your dry erase board, and maybe maybe leave it posted if you post it to implant it into the minds of your group over the, these next several weeks. It's so important for us to help our folks understand from Scripture that Jesus is fully God and fully man so that he could die on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Okay, that's a little bit of theological background for what, what we're shooting for in this lesson, the Christology, the study of Christ. Now let's look at this magnificent text and what it specifically says about that. There's so much here. I'm going to focus on the, the, the pivotal doctrines of the person of Christ and how he is fully God and fully man. What does this text tell us about this. Well, first of all, it tell, tells us that he is fully God. John 1, 1 through 4 teaches Jesus is fully God. I, I might have my group look at these first four verses in this chapter and ask them, what all do you see here 
that, that points out the deity of Christ, that, that he is God. So they, they can call out things they see. They'll, they'll, they'll see several things. Make sure that they point out each of these things or, or you can add to them. Uh, one, where it says, in the beginning was the Word. It's not in the beginning he was created. No, in the beginning was the Word. When, when God created the heavens and the earth, Jesus already was. He already was. He is preexistent God. He already existed when everything came into being. And it says the Word was with God. Uh, the Greek word with here literally means he was face to face with God, referring to the triune relationship of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They were already face to face in relationship with each other. And it says the word was God. He was God. What could be more clear than that? In fact, as, as the teacher book uh, points out, in, in Greek, the language is literally, and God was the word. Uh, the word God is in the emphatic Greek first position here, emphasizing that God, the, the deity of Jesus, he is God. Jehovah's Witnesses will try to tell you this means he was a God, but the Greek is very clear. God was the word. This word is God. Uh, it couldn't be more clear in the Greek text. And it, another point, uh, it says all things came into being by him. He created everything. And it reinforces that by saying apart from him, nothing came into being that's come into being. In other words, if it came into being, Jesus made it. And notice he is excluded from created beings. He did not come into being. He was not created. He created all the things that did come into being because he is fully God. Then verse four says, in him was life. He gave life to everything that exists. He is God who, who gave the, the breath of life to man in all creation. This scripture could not be more emphatic and clear that Jesus is fully God. But then I, I might uh, take the next step of saying, not only John 1 here teaches the deity of Jesus, many other scriptures do as well. And I, I'm going to share just a few of them with you, and you can share these with your group. Uh, or you could pass them out on strips of paper for people to look up and, and, and to read and, and talk about how each of these expresses that Jesus is God. Matthew 1, 23, Jesus is called God with us. Philippians 2, 9 says Jesus has given the name which is above every name. A lot of people don't realize that that phrase, that the name above every name was actually a Jewish term for God. The Jews considered the name of God to be so holy, they didn't want to, to say it out loud. So when they would want to refer to God, they would just say the name which is above every name. So this is a powerful witness here in Philippians 2 that Jesus is the name above all names. It's proclaiming that he is God. The whole first chapter of Hebrews is about the superiority of Jesus to the law and to the angels. And it says in verse 8, of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It calls him God specifically. Colossians 2, 9 says, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Paul wrote this book of Colossians to combat the teaching of the Gnostics who claim that the ultimate God, uh, what, what they call the, the fullness, the Greek word is the pleroma. Uh, they, they said that this pleroma, the, the God, is so far beyond us, we, we can't directly communicate with him. So there, there must be numerous intermediary beings, uh, eons or archons, or God-like rulers or beings who can give us wisdom in, in between us and God. But God made it clear in Colossians Jesus is the fullness. He is the pleroma. He is the fullness of God. Uh, Herschel Hobbes, a great pastor theologian from First Baptist Oklahoma City back in the 1900s, wrote that Colossians 1.9 is the strongest verse in all the Bible regarding the deity of Jesus. He was and is 100% God. And Jesus himself uh, letter C in, in my outline, John 1 teaches he is God. Other scriptures teach he is God. Down that letter C, he, G, Jesus himself also taught that he was God. One of the false assertions I have seen taught in various places is that the followers of Jesus may have called him God, but Jesus himself never claimed to be God. This is absolutely an ignorant statement. It's totally disproved by the words of Jesus himself. For example, in Matthew 26, uh, 63 to 65, the high priest says to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. And the high priest 
tore his robes and said he is blasphemed. Obviously, Jesus made himself very clear here. They knew exactly what he was saying. That expression, you have said it yourself, is an idiom in their language, very similar to our expression, you said it. Uh, when, when someone asks you, you, you're going to the beach, aren't you? And you say, you said it. That's another way of saying yes. So when Jesus says here, you have said it yourself, he was basically saying, yes, I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. And obviously these Jewish leaders knew what he was saying because they tore their robes and, and called it blasphemy. They knew exactly what he was claiming to be God. In John 8, 56 to 59, Jesus said to the Jews, before Abraham came into being, I am. That's the name God gave Moses in Exodus 3 when Moses asked him for his name. And here Jesus says, I am that I am. Those Jews knew exactly what he was claiming. That's why they picked up stones to stone him because they knew he was claiming to be I am, the Yahweh God of the Old Testament. Then in John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Again, it says the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They knew he was clearly making himself out to be God. In John 14, 9, Philip had said to Jesus, just show us the Father and that's enough for us. Jesus responded, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Then in John 20, 28, after the resurrection of Jesus, when Thomas saw him, he called him my Lord and my God. Now in Acts 14, when the people of Lystra began to worship Paul and Barnabas, they, they stopped them and said, don't worship us, we're just men like you. In Revelation 19, when John started to worship the angel that was speaking to him, the angel stopped him and said, don't do that, I'm a fellow servant of yours. But when Thomas called Jesus, my Lord and my God, Jesus did not stop him. Instead, he said, because you've seen, have you believed? Because that is exactly who he is. He is Lord, he is God. This, this book of John tells us that he is God. Other scriptures tell us he is God. And Jesus himself claimed to be God, the, the full deity of Jesus. For an illustration, you might share the story of a Chinese student here in the States who had been uh, tutored by some Christians who were witnessing uh, to her. She was asked, what difference would it make if Christ were God? She said, we should respect him because he's different from all others. He has another position. He is God. You might share that story and then ask your group the same question. What difference does it make if Jesus was God? Or you could even turn and say, well, what difference would it make if he wasn't God? And you can talk about that. Your group can, can talk about that. Then you might close that discussion time by saying something like, you know, the, the question is often asked, how can believing in some guy who lived 2,000 years ago change my life today? The answer is because it wasn't just some guy who lived 2,000 years ago. It was God who came down to earth that day in Bethlehem. And though he died on a cross 2,000 years ago, Romans 1, 4 says he was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. He's alive today. Jesus Christ is not just some guy. He was not just a good man or, or a religious teacher who lived 2,000 years ago. He is God. And because he is God, he can change your life if you'll respond to him the way Thomas did and fall at his feet and call him my Lord and my God. So he is fully God. Secondly, he is also fully man, this scripture teaches. John 1, 14 says, And the word, this fully God we saw from verses 1, 4, uh, 1 through 4, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became flesh. This is the doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus. Incarnation literally means in flesh meant. This 100% God put on 100% real human flesh. Jesus is fully God and fully man. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus did take on a human body. Uh, this, this scripture makes it clear here in John 1, 14, the word became flesh. In John, uh, 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3, uh, the apostle John wrote that to counter the false uh, teaching of the docetic heresy. Uh, and he, he said, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus coming in the flesh like he just taught, is not from God. Those are strong words, but he's emphasizing the, the vital importance of the doctrine of the incarnation. And Jesus himself taught his real humanity as well. 
when he appeared to his disciples after the resurrection from the dead. He said in Luke 24, 39, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Here Jesus made it very clear. He was not just a vision or an apparition. He didn't just seem to be a man. He said he had flesh and bones. So just as he claimed to be God, he also taught that he was a real man as well. His incarnation means he came in the flesh as a real 100% man. One illustration you might use with this point, a couple of years ago, the president of Ursuline College made headlines when she decided to move into the women's dorm at the college. Uh, so many college professors and administrators accused of living in their academic ivory towers uh, removed from what goes on in the lives of their students. So this president decided to do something about it and moved in with her students. Uh, she said at the time, it would either be the best thing she ever did or the most foolish, but at least it would help her to understand her students better. Well, that college president couldn't be accused of staying in an ivory tower and not, connect, not connecting with her students, and neither can our God. He did not stay in his ivory tower in heaven, but God the Son, Jesus Christ, came to earth to live with us as a man. That's what Christmas is really all about. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us, as Matthew 1 says. God became a man and came to save us. Another illustration you could use with this point on the incarnation, the, the real humanity of Jesus, would be Paul Harvey's classic reading of the man and the birds. So many of you probably know that. Uh, it, it goes like this. The, the man to whom I'm going to introduce you was not a Scrooge. He was a kind, decent, mostly good man, generous to his family, upright in his dealings with other men, but he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff that churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense. He was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. I'm sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite and uh, that he'd much rather just stay at home, but he'd wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier and then went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, then another, then another, sort of a thump or a thud. At first, he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against his living room window, but when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They'd been caught in the storm and in a desperate search for shelter, had tried to fly through his large landscape window. Well, he couldn't let the poor uh, creatures lie there and, and freeze, so he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter if he could direct the birds to it. Quickly, he put on a coat, galoshes, tramped through the deepening snow to the barn. He opened the doors wide and turned on a light, but the birds did not come in. He figured food would entice them in, so he hurried back to the house, fetched breadcrumbs, sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow, lighted, wide open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs and continued to flap around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms. Instead, they scattered in every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And then he realized they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I'm a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Because any move he, tended to, he, he made tended to frighten them, confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. If only I could be a bird, he thought to himself, and mingle with them and speak their language. Then I could tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them so they could see and hear and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring and he sank to his knees in the snow. The reason that man sank to his knees in the snow is that he suddenly realized that what he wanted to do for those birds is exactly what God did for us in the incarnation of Jesus. He had to become one of us 
so that he could save us. Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore he had to be made like his brethren to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus had to become one of us in order to save us. It had to be a real man who died on the cross representing us there. But just a man uh, on the cross couldn't save us. It was God on the cross, the sinless sacrifice who bore our sins in his body who saved us. Jesus had to be both fully God and fully man in order to save us. And that's what this lesson here in John teaches us. There is so much theology here in this text, and it's important. Uh, these are some of the most vital teachings of our faith, but make sure you don't just keep it way up here in, in the theological uh, stratosphere. Bring it home to the individual lives of your group members. I'd be sure to make the point, listen, as important as all of this uh, doctrine is, the devil and the demons know this stuff but they aren't saved. You've got to put your trust in Jesus as your own Lord and Savior. Like verse 12 says, as many as received him, emphasize that, verse 12, you've got to receive him. To them, he gave the right to become the children of God. You've got to receive Jesus. You've got to make him your Lord and God. Like Thomas, you've got to say to him, my Lord and my God. And you might at the end of your class say, if you've never done that, why don't you pray a prayer like this and lead them in a prayer of salvation? There's several great places in the book of John to lead class members to Christ, and this is one of those places. There's so much here, but I hope this will help you some as you prepare for this week. Remember, if you'd like to, to read or print out a text version of this overview, maybe print out that Paul Harvey story or, or print out the, uh, the theological chart. You can get that on my blog at www.seanethomas.com. I'll also try to put that address and, and, the, and the pictures in the comments below uh, if you'd like to use that. If you'll hit subscribe to this video, YouTube will automatically send you next week's video so you don't have to search for it. And if you write something in the comment section below, I'll be sure to pray for you and your group by name this week. Per my licensing agreement with LifeWay, these weekly lessons are based on content from Explore the Bible Adult Resources. This presentation is my own, and it has not been reviewed by LifeWay. LifeWay resources are available at GoExploreTheBible.com and GoExploreTheBible.com slash adults dash training. If you have questions about Explore the Bible resources, you may send emails to ExploreTheBible at LifeWay.com.